Thank you. Please be seated. There are extra seats so you can pull out and, and sit down. You don't have to sit in the windowsill. So it's nice to see everybody. So thank you for coming this afternoon. Welcome. Um, the title of my lecture is The Shape of Musical Time. I think every single one of you in here today has asked me at some point during the week whether or not I would be playing musical examples. Um, so I added one. <laughs> But I, I resisted rolling out the piano. I'm going to actually use words, so we're going we're to use some words. Um, and in some sense, the lecture is about the relationship between words and music, so um, hopefully that'll be okay. And you're not too disappointed um, or relieved. Actually, don't tell me which one. So. The lecture will present three moments in time, and I want to give an account of these three moments. Um, for those of you visiting us, there's uh, a break after the lecture, which is about an hour, probably a little less, hopefully. And then um, behind us, there's a room, the junior common room, and we can meet for questions and conversation. And um, Mr. Rode has set up a speaker so I can DJ if you missed music, and we can play some music then. So imagine that it's 385 BC and you are a musician wandering just north of Athens with a kithara slung over your shoulder. A kithara is like a giant lute. I mean, it's huge, so this is a ridiculous image, but it sounds like guitar, so I'm starting with that. So. You had traveled to Athens from Thebes a few years ago to participate in the musical competitions at the Pan-Athenaic Games, but you didn't win. Without the accolades and financial success that come with such a victory, you have had to work for a living as a professional musician the past few years, playing various banquets and social functions in the city. You retired from carrying your kithara, a heavy instrument, especially the 11 string version you play. It's times like these when you wish you still played the aulos, and I'll remind you that the aulos is often translated in the text that we read here as flute, which is, a, is a, a misleading translation. Flutes are nice and pretty. The aulos is a double reed instrument that took lots of work to blow and probably sounded like a cross between an oboe and a bagpipe or something like that. In fact, in fact, some of the vase paintings have pictures of these cheek things that keep your cheeks from puffing out like Dizzy Gillespie when you play it. Athena hated it. She threw it off, off of Mount Olympus, and Pan took it up. <laughs> the aulos used to be a respectable instrument. Your father was one of the best aulos players in Thebes, and you had been quite good on the aulos in your youth. But after Alcibiades, Alcibiades famously abandoned the aulos because he considered it an ugly and ignoble instrument that distorts your face when you blow into it, and prevents you from singing, the instrument went out of fashion. You resented the fact that Alcibiades said only slavish Thebans should play this instrument, since they are no good at conversation anyhow. Unfortunately, it does seem like only slaves play the aulos anymore. Perhaps you should follow the lead of Alcibiades and take up the lyre. There's a respectable instrument more socially elevated than the kithara you are currently carrying. You are sure you could learn to play the lyre as well as some of those snooty lyric poets following in the steps of your fellow Theban Pindar. Too bad you have to work for a living, constantly hustling gigs, and don't have the social capital required to write odes. Maybe you could get a steady position in a respectable household teaching music to a young nobleman. It is at that moment that you happen to walk by the newly opened Academy of Plato. Now here is a place of learning, you think. Maybe they know something about teaching music. You had heard that Plato's teacher, Socrates, was practicing music in prison just before his death. Perhaps you could learn something from these guys. You walk up to the door and notice the inscription overhead. Let none but geometers 
enter here. Well, that might be a problem. Everybody knows that only a few citizens in Athens have the good fortune and leisure to study geometry. On the other hand, you remember a conversation you had with that musician who came to Athens 20 years ago as a member of Mino's entourage when Mino was passing through on his doomed expedition to find fame and fortune fighting in the East. This musician, who wisely stayed behind in Athens when Mino moved on, had just recently related to you a conversation between Mino and Socrates that occurred just a few years before Socrates' death. That conversation at one point involved a slave boy from Mino's household who was able to learn some geometry from Socrates merely by answering the questions Socrates asked of him. According to the story, the slave boy, all of a sudden, saw the answer to the problems posited by Socrates, almost as if the boy was recollecting something he had always known. You remember thinking when you heard this that you, too, had experienced something like the sudden insight of this slave boy. Often, when you improvise on your kithara, the shape of music will emerge all at once, as if it had always been there just waiting to be discovered. You decide that even a practicing musician like you might learn something at this academy, even if you never had the good fortune to formally study geometry. So you knock. And the door opens, the doorman emerges, looks you up and down, takes a look at your kithra and says quietly, sorry, too many strings. <laughs> Defeated, you work your way down to the Piraeus. As you walk by the merchants, skillfully manipulating the pebbles along the lines of their counting boards, Quickly calculating complex transactions on their powerful instrument, a Babylonian cousin to the abacus, the right number appearing readily at their fingertips, you suddenly realize that you should probably go home and practice if you want to win those 1,000 drachmas at the next Panathenaeum. Imagine now that it's 1829, and you are a piano player trying to make a living in Vienna. Once again, you are a musician from a long line of musicians, perhaps with an ancestor who played the kithra. Your father was a Kapellmeister for a minor Austrian nobleman, and you grew up in the servants' quarters on his country estate. For centuries, the best position a musician could find was in the service of either the church or the aristocracy. While not always flute girls, musicians have tended to be handmaidens of some kind. You play in various salons around town and have a reputation as quite an accomplished improviser. You even wrangled a couple of lessons from the renowned Karl Czerny, student of Beethoven, who just published a useful guidebook to piano improvisation. However, it has been harder to get gigs these days. People are becoming less and less impressed with the great skills of the instrumental virtuosi. More and more, the very best in society are looking to present composers of the most fashionable and cutting edge new works. Nowadays, it seems that you have to be a musical genius and a creator of great works in order to really make it in the music business. The notion of musical genius is relatively new. In fact, it was only a few decades ago when Kant, in his Critique of Judgment, first introduced the concept of artistic genius as, and this is a quote, that innate mental predisposition through which nature gives the rule to art. Previously, unquote, previously art was considered merely an imitation of nature Music took the shape of the affectation or idea that it set out to represent. As Plato put it, the poet is third from the truth, an imitator of some particular thing that is itself an imitation of the eidos or shape of the thing. The musician then might even be fourth from the truth, 
since music is dependent upon language to articulate its object of representation. How can you tell what a song is about if you don't know the words? Or at least a title or something. Language informs the shape of music. But Kant begins to change all of that. Now, the artistic genius has some direct, intuitive access to nature. The artist does not imitate nature as it appears to us, but discovers and articulates the shape of the world directly. As a result, the musician has moved up in the world, no longer considered the least of the imitative arts and a mere handmaiden hand of logos. Music is now esteemed as the highest and most sublime form of art, an art that articulates the very shape of being itself. In fact, Schopenhauer, in his recently published book, The World as Will and Representation, goes as far as claiming that music does not represent any idea at all, as all the other art forms do, but is a direct copy of the will itself. The character of this will, according to Schopenhauer, is constant striving, a kind of perpetual becoming that manifests itself in the world as objects of representation. Music, particularly music whose principle of organization is tonal harmony, is identical in shape to this striving will. In fact, Schopenhauer argues that music, like the entire world itself, is essentially embodied will. As a result, music has been emancipated from language, which always participates in ideas, and music now is understood to give us direct access to the universal will. The modern composer of instrumental music may now even surpass the poets in the high priesthood of German Romanticism. All this is pretty exciting stuff to a 19th century musician like yourself. But ironically, the recent elevation of music hasn't been great for your career. The problem is you're just a piano player. A really good one, but not a composer. Nowadays, composers rule. Musicians, since the rhapsodes of ancient Greece, have always been great improvisers. But now one needs to be a homer, an author of great works, in order to get any respect. Improvisers have too much in common with the itinerant gypsies camped outside of Vienna to garner much notice. You partly blame Beethoven for all this. Ever since E.T.A. Hoffman raised him up as the master of the sublime work of art, everyone wants musicians to be the godlike creators of meaning. Geniuses who have access to the harmony of the cosmos and the very shape of being itself. It's a heavy burden for a mere piano player. It is all well and good to recognize the harmonic genius of modern composers. But you feel as though this account of music misses something fundamental and trivializes the real-time spontaneity of musical conversation. Plus, you like jamming with those gypsy violinists when they are in town. Their playing really speaks to you. Maybe there is another way to think about the shape of music that does not reduce music to a mere echo of philosophic forms. Even Schopenhauer's new elevation of music keeps music one step below philosophic understanding, which, in the end, turns out to be saintly compared to the semi-divine accomplishments of the composer. Isn't playing music really about being in tune and being in time with others, rather than manifesting the timeless shape of being itself, even if that being turns out to be a kind of perpetual becoming? You remember back to your student days at the turn of the century in Jena, just before Napoleon invaded the city, and those lectures on the philosophy of art by that crazy professor, what was his name? Friedrich Wilhelm Joseph von Schelling, college roommate of Hegel and Holderlin, and good friend of Goethe. He was the one who first made you think about the fact that, quote, the necessary form of music is succession, unquote. 
Music only exists in its performance, a performance which unfolds over time. Like Schopenhauer, Schelling thinks that art gives us access to the nature of the world and considers music as somehow the most fundamental of the arts. However, Schopenhauer's account of music borrows heavily from the harmonic theory of Jean-Philippe Rameau, an account of music that measures musical voices primarily in terms of their harmonic relationship to a fundamental base. As a result, the vertical relationship of the pitches in a musical work is the primary logos of music. Schopenhauer sees the relationship between the bass, the middle voices, and the melody as analogous to the hierarchy of being itself, ranging from the ground base of the mass of the planet through the inner voices of the plants and beasts, rising to the sublime melody of the human intellect. For Schopenhauer, melody is, quote, the highest grade of the objectification of will, the intellectual life and effort of man, as he alone, because endowed with reason, constantly looks before and after on the path of his actual life and its innumerable possibilities, and so achieves a course of life which is intellectual and therefore connected as a whole. Corresponding to this, I, Schopenhauer, say, the melody has significant intentional connection from beginning to end. It records, therefore, the history of the intellectually enlightened will." End quotation. Although Schopenhauer here recognizes that melody depends upon a coherent unfolding of the past into the present on the way to some future resolution, he hears the essence of this melody as a constant harmonic striving for this resolution, however fleeting that re resolution may be in the end. Schelling, on the other hand, sees that both melody and harmony presuppose rhythm. He writes that, in a quotation, music is nothing other than the primal rhythm of nature and of the universe itself, which by means of this art breaks through into the world of representation." Unquote. While the intellectually enlightened will for Schopenhauer is analogous to the harmonic teleology of a melody, for Schelling, the cyclical coherence of rhythm animates human life. Just as music is the manifestation of a primal rhythm of existence, within the context of music itself, Schelling claims that, quote, rhythm is the music within music. And in some sense, it's that quote, which I really want to try to figure out today. What does it mean to say that rhythm is the music within music? Like any musician, you know what rhythm is. But it seems important to give an account, an account that both describes and informs the practice of music. Perhaps that is why you went to all those philosophy of art lectures at university in the first place. How did Schelling's account go? How did he put his words, or how did he put into words his understanding of music? Unlike Schopenhauer, Schelling does not think that music is beyond or before ideas. Quote, whereas philosophy intuits these ideas as they are in themselves, art intuits them objectively. The ideas, to the extent that they are intuited objectively, are therefore the substance, and as it were, the universal and absolute material of art, from which all particular works of art emerge as mature entities." Unquote. Perhaps for this reason, Schelling insists upon maintaining the connection between language and what he calls the formative arts, which include everything from music to painting and sculpture, all the arts in which the shape of the objects and ideas are informed or inform the physical shape of the artwork, give form to the physical shape of the artwork. Rather than seeing music as the highest of the arts because it operates outside and beyond language, Schelling sees all creation as an act of articulation. Just as God first spoke the world into being, so the artist also articulates the nature of things. 
But this speaking into being is not primarily the fixing of a static world or a work, but, in, but an animating activity of a, a living being that informs the shape of things. And now I want to draw your attention to the first quote that was on the handout that I gave. The people in the window look lost. They have no idea. Okay. There's some extra handouts lying around. And this is from uh, the philosophy of art lectures that Schelling published, were published actually by Schelling's son much later in his life. Language and reason, which is precisely absolute knowledge, the knowledge of ideas, have one and the same expression in most languages. Furthermore, in most philosophic and religious systems, particularly those of the Orient, the eternal and absolute act of self-affirmation in God, his eternal act of creating, is designated as the speaking word of God, the Logos, which is simultaneously God himself. Considering the sublime significance of language, namely that it is not merely the relative act of knowledge, but rather the act that is simultaneously integrated with its counterpoint and is to that extent absolute, we will not juxtapose absolutely the formative arts with the verbal arts, as do most authors which is why, for example, they have difficulty counting music as one of the formative arts and thus granted a special position, as Schopenhauer does. Just as knowledge still grasps or renders itself symbolically in language, so also does divine knowledge apprehend itself symbolically in the world, such that also the whole of the real world, whole in so much as it is itself the unity of the real and the ideal, is itself the primal act of speaking. Yet the real world is no longer the living word, the speech of God himself, but rather only the spoken or extended word. In this way, the formative arts are only the dead word, and yet nonetheless word, the act of speaking. The more completely the speaking dies, as far as the utterance that has turned to stone on the lips of Niobe, the more sublime is formative art in its own fashion. In contrast, on the lower level, or even the more fundamental level, in music, that living element that has passed over into death, the word spoken into the finite is still perceptible only as sonority. End of quotation. Well, that's a lot of words. Good thing you took notes at those lectures. How can you make sense of this account? How does music arise from the dying off of words? Perhaps an example experienced in real time would help. You have a musician friend who insists that he can hear the melody of every conversation. He once tried to teach you how to hear the melody of language by repeating a phrase over and over again until the utterance all of a sudden manifest a melody. We're gonna try this experiment together. And now the DJ is telling me there's something wrong with the experiment. <laughs> Apparently, the child protection lock on my iPad has defeated the... <laughs> <laughs> Things are complicated in 1829. <laughs> so this example, which uh, can be played here in a second, is, um, comes from a CD that I owned long before it was on Radio Lab um, by a perceptual psychologist named Dinah Deutsch, who's uh, a psychologist at the University of California. And this comes from her CD entitled Musical Illusions and Paradoxes. It's about two minutes long. In our final demonstration, speech is made to be heard as sound. And this is achieved without transforming the words in any way or by adding any musical context but simply by repeating a spoken phrase several times over. The demonstration is based on a sentence at the beginning of my CD, Musical Illusions and Paradoxes. When you listen to this sentence in the usual way, it appears to be spoken normally, as indeed it is. But when you play part of it over and over again, a curious thing happens. 
At some point, instead of appearing to be spoken, the words appear to be sung. Here it is. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. But they sometimes behave so strangely, they sometimes behave so strangely, 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 so strangely, so strangely, so strangely, so strangely. Now here's the sentence that you just heard. You might find that it begins by sounding like normal speech, just as before, but that when you come to the phrase that had been repeated, the words again appear to be sung. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. It's great to stand up here and watch the light. My music class, they're all smiling because they, they heard it last week and it was already melody for them and then one by one. <laughs> You'll never hear that sentence again without the melody. I don't know if that's what that means. But. So melody appears here all of a sudden, I hope, and it may not have happened for, it, for everybody, so we could talk about in the question period why that might be the case, which is interesting in and of itself, but judging from the laughter... Melody appears here all of a sudden for most of you as the passing of speech into sonority. The coherence of the utterance becomes a musical coherence as our attention is directed away from the meaning of the words to their underlying sound just through repetition and sort of uncontrollably and irresistibly. For Schelling, the quote, sonority of body stands in a direct relationship with their coherence, unquote. And another quote, sonority itself is simply the intuition of the soul of the body itself, unquote. Let me say that again. So sonority itself is simply the intuition of the soul of the body itself. With the appearance of the melody, we ourselves become attuned to the embodied nature of the particular utterance of another. As we look around at one another, we see this awareness switch on in those around us, altering us, oh, I'm sorry, only altering us, but also alerting us to the fact that this other body is intersubjectively available to us. As the phrase is repeated in a looped rhythm, the meaning of the sentence dies off and a melody appears. It is the rhythmic repetition of speech which seems to make the melody manifest for us. We might even be able to articulate the rhythmic sonority that gives coherence to this particular melody, I think. I think we're almost all there. I'm not judging. No, you say. <laughs> this rhythm is not abstracted from the utterance and the melody, but is the sonority, that is to say the coherence, that presents the phrase as a coherent temporal unit all along. We become conscious of this underlying temporality when we attend to the repeated unit of the original utterance and bring to the surface its rhythmic coherence as rhythm. This rhythmic sonority was always present as the temporal coherence of the utterance, but it is not explicitly present or present at all to our consciousness as long as we are attending to the meaning of the sentence or even the tonal shape of the melody that first emerges. But now we have learned to hear the rhythm of the speech. But what does this odd trick of perception have to do with the actual practice of music? Schelling observes that, big quote on your page number two, try to illustrate this as we go. 
the ancients roundly attributed to rhythm the greatest aesthetic power. Neither can one easily deny that everything one can truly call beautiful in music or call truly beautiful or dance actually has to do with rhythm. In order to comprehend rhythm most purely, however, we must separate out, separate out everything else in music that is stimulating or exciting. Tones, for example, are also significant in themselves. They can be cheerful, gentle, sad, or painful. Yet when we view rhythm, we must completely abstract from them. Its beauty is not material, and it does not require the merely natural affectations residing within tones in and for themselves in order to be absolutely pleasing and to enchant a receptive soul. To see this more clearly, imagine first the elements of rhythm as being completely indifferent, as are, for example, the individual tones of a string by themselves or the beat of a drum. I feel like John Cage up here. <laughs> How can a series of such beats become significant? exciting or pleasing. Beats or tones that succeed one another without the slightest of order have no effect on us, except to make you look up from your page of music. Though these tones may be completely meaningless and not even modestly pleasing by themselves or as simple sounds, as soon as they acquire regularity, such that they continually reoccur at equal intervals and collectively constitute a unit, we already encounter something of rhythm albeit only a very distant beginning, and we are irresistibly called to attentiveness. The human being, however, driven by an impulse of nature, seeks through rhythm to impose variety or diversity onto everything that in and for itself constitutes a pure identity of activity. In every activity that is by nature meaningless, such as counting, one, two, We do not long endure within that uniformity. It gets tedious. We divide it into units. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Most mechanical, this is a little bit condescending, but most mechanical workers make their work easier this way. The inner pleasure of that, not really conscious, but rather unconscious, counting enables us to forget the work. And the individual comes in with the hammer on the railroad tie in its appropriate place with a kind of pleasure, since it would pain him to see the rhythm interrupted, perhaps. Until now, we have described only the most imperfect kind of rhythm, in which the entire unity within a particular multiplicity depends only on the uniformity of the intervals within the sequence. An image of this might be equally large, equally separated points, a series of dots. This is the lowest level of rhythm. The argument is that the series of dots has a rhythm. A higher kind of unity within multiplicity is acquired, first of all, if the individual tones or beats are not sounded with equal strength, but rather alternate according to a certain regular, strong, and weak ones. With this, the necessary element of tact, or what we might call meter, I suppose, enters into rhythm. So, one. This too is sought whenever something identical is to become different or varied and is capable of numerous variations itself whereby an even greater variety enters into the uniformity of the sequence. In general, rhythm is viewed as the transformation of an essentially meaningless succession into a meaningful one. Succession or sequence purely as such possess the character of chance. The transformation of the accidental nature of a sequence into necessity equals rhythm, whereby the whole is no longer subjected to time but rather possesses time within itself. Articulation within music is the forming of units into a series such that several tones together constitute yet another unit, one that is not accidentally or arbitrarily separated from others. End of the quotation. If we add tact to our phrase, which we just had, we can develop something like a meaningful theme. One that I would suggest dances in some way by 
introducing the regularity and the pulse to the coherence that was abstracted from the utterance. And this dance can serve as the ground for limitless variation. We, we all behave strangely sometimes. So. <laughs> one, one final quote from Schelling, also on your handout. Quotation, I'm sorry, Mr. Ogla, quotation. So I did look it up, and I think quote's now acceptable because we misused it so much. But, but I'll get in trouble on some of them. The necessary form of music is succession, for time is the universal form of the informing of the infinite into the finite. And to that extent, it is intuited as form, abstracted from the real. The principle of time within the subject is self-consciousness, which is precisely the informing within the ideal of the unity of consciousness into multiplicity. This also enables us to comprehend better the close relationship between the sense of hearing in general and music and speech in particular with self-consciousness. It also enables us to comprehend in a preliminary fashion, until we have demonstrated its high, even higher significance, the arithmetical side of music. Music is the real self-numbering of the soul. Pythagoras already compared the soul to a number. Yet for precisely that reason, it is also an unconscious, self-forgetting numbering and counting. Hence, Leibniz could say, music is the rapture of the unknowing soul numbering itself. End of the quotation. By drawing our attention to the shape of musical time, we can become conscious of this unconscious numbering that is music. By knowing ourselves in this way, we might gain control over the self-numbering of the soul and freely choose the particular accounting by which we order our being in time with others. Perhaps music isn't just about the harmonic shape of musical works after all, or at least not only. Musical rapture is a function of rhythmic numbering. Perhaps if more people in Vienna recognize the intrinsic value of keeping good time, you could get better paying gigs. In the end, you resolve to keep jamming with the gypsies. One final moment of musical time. Now it's 1931, and you are a trumpet player in Duke Ellington's orchestra. The band has been performing during the month of August at Chicago's Lincoln Tavern, and it's nice to be back in your hometown for a few weeks. Just yesterday, Ellington introduced a new tune to the band that he wrote as a tribute to trumpeter Brubber Miley, whom you had replaced in the band when Miley left in 1929 to join Noble Sissel's orchestra for a tour to Paris. Miley was a member of Ellington's band during the formative years of the Cotton Club in New York and was instrumental in developing those growling, almost spoken sounds of the trumpet that characterized much of Ellington's music in those days. Using a variety of mutes and special effects, Miley could really make the trumpet talk. He has been recently diagnosed with tuberculosis, and Ellington dedicated this new tune to him, which he named after a catchphrase of Miley's. It don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. You are suspicious that the melody might be Miley's as well, since it is well known in the band that Ellington has a habit of taking bits and pieces of ideas that emerge from his band as source material for his compositions. Except for the tricky business of publishing money, the guys in the band usually don't mind so much, since they know that Ellington is writing parts for each individual voice in the band, and that they all are part of something larger than themselves. And Ellington works a lot, and pays well, uh, largely subsidized by the money he makes from the tunes he wrote from the ideas he stole from his band, so there's a nice circularity to the whole. <laughs> Swing music looks to be the next big thing, and you have the sense that this tune is going to be a big hit. You think to yourself that Brubber Miley's swing is a better moniker than jungle music for Ellington's sound, 
though you might find the etymology of the newer name and the older one if you wanted to dwell on it. But what's in a name? Ellington himself liked to say that there are two kinds of music, good and bad, and we play the good kind. For Duke, the highest praise he ever offered was to say that somebody's playing was beyond category. Still, swing might not be a bad name for that rhythmic element in this music that everyone finds so compelling. The song seems as much a philosophic claim as it is a tribute to Miley. And now uh, we're going to play this song. What to do? What to do? What to do? Da da do? Da da do? you can hear the voices of the instruments speaking to one another. Everyone knows what swing is. Ever since you first heard Louis Armstrong on record, you knew that you wanted to play with that rhythmic inflection that reflected the long tradition in New Orleans music of juxtaposing duple and triple rhythms. You might say that swing is the interpretation of eighth notes as triplets. You might say, oh, that's not quite right. If you wanted to be mathematical about it, swing might be considered the golden ratio between the 4-4 beat and the longer and shorter eighth note subdivisions of the swung rhythm. Or swing could be understood as the incorporation of the Afro-Cuban clave into the marches of the New Orleans society bands in the late 19th century. More importantly, as Ellington's new song insists, swing is a way of moving and playing with purpose. The essential thing for any new member in Ellington's band was to learn to be in time with the band, who were always in time with the dancers. Somehow, it was all about time. You remember talking to a friend you met at a gig in Boston about the nature of musical time just recently. He mentioned some lectures, again, 
he had attended when he was a student in Germany before the war. Before the war. I just go, go with the contrast. He had gone on and on about this professor Edmund Husserl and his lectures on the way in which we are conscious of time. It had come up because Husserl in these lectures had used music as an example of the way in which we experience time. And this friend wanted to know what you thought about musical time. Time is tricky. Augustine famously asked, quote, what then is time? I know well enough what it is, provided that nobody asks me. But if I am asked what it is and try to explain, I am perplexed. You should be familiar with that from the Confessions. Right? Sounds like the same difficulty you have when you try to explain swing. Sometimes time seems to speed up and slow down, but clocks tick by with the precision of a metronome. Sonny Greer, the drummer in Ellington's band, never had time for those things. You would sometimes practice with a metronome, but it wasn't the same as playing together with other musicians or feeling locked into the living time with which Greer animated the Ellington Orchestra. Husserl was looking to give an answer to Augustine's question, not by saying what time is in some absolute sense, which is best answered by an appeal to God or some other notion of absolute time and space, but by looking to give a phenomenology of internal time consciousness. In other words, Husserl sought to give an account of the way in which we are aware of the passing of time. The problem for Husserl has to do with the shape of the present moment. If time is an atomistic sequence of infinitesimal nows, how is it that we are able to string these moments, these cuts in a timeline perhaps, together into an experience of the now as a moment in the continuous flow from the past into the future? Other modern accounts posited that somehow we remember the just now and then put these nows together in memory to construct a sense of the flow of time. But Husserl argues that this account would lead to an infinite regress, since this sense of time would somehow have to be out of time in order to get a grasp on the passing of time. Husserl gives an elegant solution to this problem. He argues convincingly that the present moment has breadth. That is to say, the moment now includes the just was and the about to be as part of its original shape. The structure of time consciousness contains both, and these are Husserl's words, retention, the just now, and protension, the about to be, as constitutive aspects of the right now. As an example, Husserl points to the experience of melody. It is not the case that we remember the past experience of the first note and bring it forward into the present in order to make sense of the next note. The subsequent notes of the melody are presented to us along with the retention of the previous notes and the protention, or expectation even, of the upcoming notes whose present is, presence is felt in the now. Twinkle, twinkle, little. It's there as part of the melody from the beginning. I won't sing again, I promise. We are now hearing the melody this particular opening phrase that is present for us now as a whole. As Husserl puts it, and this is the last um, quotation on your handout, number four. Any reference to perception still requires some discussion here. In the perception of melody, we distinguish the tone given now, which we term the perceived, from those which have gone by, which we say are not perceived. On the other hand, we call the whole melody one that is perceived though only the now point actually is. We follow this procedure because not only is the extension of the melody given point for point and an extension of the act of perception, but also the unity of retentional consciousness still holds the expired tones themselves in consciousness and continuously establishes the unity of consciousness with reference to the homogeneous temporal object, i.e. the melody. That is to say, an objectivity such as a melody cannot itself be originally given except as perceived in this form, as a whole. The constituted act, constructed from now consciousness and retentional consciousness, is adequate perception of the temporal object. This object will indeed include temporal differences, and temporal differences are constituted precisely in such phrases in primal consciousness, retention, or protention. 
If purposive, or pur purposive, I can't, purposive intention is directed towards the melody, toward the whole object, we have nothing but perception. If the intention is directed toward a particular tone or a particular measure for its own sake, we have the perception so long as precisely the thing intended is perceived and mere retention as soon as it is past. Objectively considered, the measure no longer appears as present but as past. The whole melody, however, appears as present so long as it still sounds, so long as the notes belong to it, intended in the one nexus of apprehension still sound. The melody is passed only after the last note has gone. Until that point, we're listening to this melody now. End quote. When we attend to the melody as melody, the entire melodic phrase is present to us now. The same is true of language. This whole phrase is present to us now. That one, I just said. We experience not as a memory, a distant memory of the beginning of my lecture, but as an aspect of the present, the almost end of my lecture, what has just been said and what is about to be which you're dying to fill in because you can feel it coming. You have protension for the end of my phrase. We can debate how long this present is extended. Some evidence suggests about seven seconds or better a phrase or a breath. But we cannot deny that the present moment has this extended character for us. If the coherence of the whole phrase was not present to us all at once, we would never hear the melody or be able to understand a sentence since we, be, we would be moving from one note or syllable to another without hearing any connection among the notes in the present. The coherence of a phrase is possible because the present moment includes, as part of its original constitution, to use Swiss rose language, retention and protension. But the question of the now is not simply a question about perception. More significantly, Husserl is interested in the constitution of our very selves and the relationship between ourselves and others. Since Socrates, philosophers have worked under the injunction to know oneself, and since Descartes, certain knowledge of the self has become a prerequisite for any understanding of the world at all, let alone other selves. Husserl's account of time consciousness rests on the insight that the structure of an ever unfolding now has as part of its constitution the not now. I find myself in this moment, but the I in this moment also contains the I that just was and the I that is about to be implicated in my sense of self now. As Husserl puts it, quote, every living present contains in its concrete intentionality an entire life itself. And within this perceptual present of consciousness, there is also contained as one objectivity with its universe of all objectivity, objectivity as a horizon that could have validity for me and in a certain manner also that objectivity that will still have validity for me, validity for me in the future. End of quotation. Or as your friend at that bar in Boston explained it to you not so long ago, and here the part of your friend will be played by my friend, Nicholas de Warren, whose book on Husserl and the Promise of Time I will quote briefly here and upon whom I am indebted for my understanding of Husserl, if I have one at all. This is a quotation from Nicholas. Time consciousness always anticipates the next original presentation and, in this sense, anticipates itself. Yet the arrival of the actual now is an eruption of the new, a beginning anew of the world and of consciousness itself in its constitutional significance. The alterity of the new does not interrupt the course of time consciousness from the outside, but it interrupts from within by ejecting consciousness from itself, throwing consciousness ahead of itself in such a manner that consciousness cannot recuperate itself entirely despite its own accomplishments in the folding and unfolding of temporality. Consciousness illuminates the medium of its own opacity. From the beginning, I am already other than myself, end of quotation. In some sense, I am always already another self to myself. This otherness is not an alienation, but conversely, it is the structure, structure of subjectivity itself and by its very constitution provides a groundwork for an intersubjectivity 
with other selves that for Husserl constitutes the objectivity of the world. Just as Descartes finds in his meditations a grounding for the world, Husserl finds in his own meditations a grounding for our being in the world with others. The objectivity of this world is intersubjective, or as Professor DeWarren puts it, the last quotation. There is, a, there is constituted a community of egos and a community of monads. This means that transcendental intersubjectivity has, due to this community, an intersubjective sphere of ownness in which the objective world is constituted. We can unpack all this in the question period. <laughs> Husserl then says that we recognize the intersubjective proper essence of the objective world. We recognize that this is not a transcendence in the proper sense, but that it is an imminent transcendence, which he means, what he means, is that the objective world as idea is the ideal correlate of an inner subjective experience. Each monad is constituted within a system of harmony with other monads, a harmonizing of constitutive systems. This introduces the notion of monadic harmony and so offers a view on the entire sequence of constitutional steps that provides the only possible solution to the transcendental problem and so the only way to realize the transcendental idealism of phenomenology. End of the quotation from my friend Nicholas. This transcendental idealism of phenomenology is located somewhere between the philosophic poles of transcendental idealism in the old sense and the modern threat of nihilism. This region is the inner subjective world in which we live. Our fundamental being in the world is being with, perhaps opposed to being there, both with ourselves and with others. If we consider this being with only in terms of bodies and space, perhaps geometrically, we might think that the distance between here and there, between you and me, is insurmountable. But if we see this being with as a harmony among monads, as a dance with others in time, then the distance between self and other can be overcome when we experience ourselves moving together upon occasion in the same time, to the same tune with others. If we manage to do this well, we might even swing. Ellington's band, you realize, is nothing if not a community of egos who are really good at playing together and making articulate a lived time that is objectively available to listeners who, more often than not, are moved to dance. Music can articulate the inner subjectivity of lived time, and this lived time don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. So what do we mean by swing? We could treat it as a geometry of rhythm, but this account is only half the picture. Swing is also a practice, a practice of being in time with others, a way of being in time with others that makes possible the discovery of the individual voice by means of a voluntary submission to the natural and conventional constraints of moving with others. Swing is a dance, a graceful affirmation in the face of adversity, according to Albert Murray, author of Stomping the Blues a kind of American birth of tragedy that posits swing as the quintessentially American response to the problem of existence. <laughs> I, buy, I buy that. Paradoxically, we are most free when we recognize our limitations and interdependence. Rather than trying to replace God as the underwriter of order, there is no attempt to justify life as an aesthetic experience here. The jazz musician improvises in response to others who have also submitted to the constraints of time and place. Perhaps it's not such a bad way to make a living during the Depression. Since this is a St. John's lecture, I don't feel much obligated to go past 1936. <laughs> but I look forward to talking a bit more about the shape of music in the 21st century in the question period.